we're getting rid of all of our Lumix cameras. For the past five years, we've been big Lumix users here at Scratch Takes. We started off by getting a GH5, then we bought a GH5S, followed by three BGH1s, and finally a Lumix S1H for that nice full frame look. They served us super well, and I do think that at the time that I started investing into cameras, the Lumix system was still probably the best system for our needs. So let me start by highlighting some of the reasons why we invested in this camera system to begin with. I think it'll help explain why we're now moving away. When the BGH1 was first announced, we were a pretty small video production company, and most of what we did was multi-camera live streams or concert recording. This SDI port was key in that decision, and the fact that it also had a BNC timecode in was fantastic because if we weren't live cutting something on the spot, we could just throw a couple of ultra syncs, the Atomex ultra syncs on this, have everything sync for post-production editing, and it was just a breeze. It made our workflow that much faster. When you're working with multiple cameras, multiple takes, and multiple audio tracks, that time code in is imperative. Another plus about this camera compared to the other ones we were buying at the time is that it came with a power supply. And since most of what we did was long concert recordings, you know, an hour and a half to two hours, the camera had to be on for extended periods of time. That power supply, the fact that it came in the box was very good. And last, let's talk about this micro four thirds sensor because on YouTube, we do hear a lot about the full frame hype. And while I do understand it, and I do think that there is a time and place for full frame, when you're doing broadcast live stream concert capture, you have to be at the end of a concert hall, theater, church, and the goal is to get up close. Having a crop sensor is actually beneficial. And these crop sensor, micro four third sensor systems have very good low light. So especially the BGH1 actually, I would say that it's probably the best of all of these. The BGH1 has fantastic low light. It's actually surprising. That combined with the two times crop makes it so that if you throw a 200 millimeter lens on this, you're getting a 400 millimeter equivalent. That is fantastic for what we used to do. So that's the quick overview onto why we invested in this camera system to begin with. Now let's talk about the six reasons why we're moving away from it. Reason number one, the SDI port is 3G. This is not something I realized when I bought into the system. I'm, I thought I had read everything about it and I thought it was 4K out, but the SDI out is unfortunately only 3G, which means that it maxes out at 1080p 60. Most of the work we do is 4K 30. We like the resolution plus the 30 frames per second works well for a broadcast environment. A lot of broadcasters ask for 30 frames per second. And if you want to do live streams, it tends to work better at 30 frames per second. If you do 24, things get out of sync all the time. I do not recommend it. And so that was a pretty big limitation. In order to get around this problem, we ended up buying an HDMI to SDI 6G converter because the HDMI port on this is 4K. So at least we were able to do our 4K productions, stream in 1080p, and then deliver the final result in 4K. But we did have to work around. It was not something that simply worked out of the box. I find this a very strange choice for Lumix to have made because HDMI is known for not being able to do long runs. And so now you have a connector that does short runs and 4K, whereas you have a broadcast connector that's been doing this since the 80s, I believe, and it's maxed out at 1080p. It's just, it doesn't really make sense. On top of that, you can do 4K RAW with this with a Ninja 5, but I hate recording RAW through an HDMI cable. It's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you use the most consumer connection on your camera in order to attempt the most professional output from it. It's just, it's mind boggling. It doesn't make any sense to me. We found a workaround and it worked. It was okay. Reason number two, the BGH1 doesn't have a screen. Now that is something that I knew going into the purchase of this camera, but I don't think I comprehended just how much it would affect our workflow. I would say one of the biggest reasons why the GH5 was so popular when it first came out is because it was one of the few camera systems to have a touch screen and being able to do touch autofocus, navigate your menus, all of that using the touch screen in combination with the little control wheel, 
just made for an incredibly fast workflow. Fast forward to the purchase of the BGH-1 and you lose that entire touchscreen interface with this camera. This camera does not have a dedicated screen connector the way a RED camera does or the Sony FX6 does where you still get that touchscreen interface. This simply has the HDMI out and the SDI out and you just get the video feed. So you have to navigate this entire camera using the control wheel and the buttons. On top of that, it's just frustrating to not be able to quickly use this camera if you wanna bring it to a scout and just, just check your framing. It becomes a whole thing, you have to rig it up every single time. Whereas a camera like the GH5, you just show up and you point at something and you get what you came there for quickly, which to me is very important. And lastly on that point, all the camera operators that I work with really dislike not having a screen and not being able to intuitively operate this camera, which leads me to the next point, number three. This is an extremely unintuitive camera. Speaking of my camera operators, this is one of the worst cameras that you can present to a camera operator for a job because they will need your help to set it up. If you compare a BGH-1 to most Sony, Canon, Blackmagic, or even other Lumix cameras, I've pretty much given them a camera be like, you know, set it to this frame rate, this resolution, this white balance, and in 30 minutes time, it'll be on a tripod, set up, and good to go. Unfortunately, with this camera, unless it's someone who works with us regularly, they'll forget how to use it or just simply not even know how to start. It is not intuitive at all. Let me give you an example. The GH5 has the two dials, top and front, uh, for the iris and shutter speed that is pretty standard with most cameras. And on the top, you've got white balance and ISO, very clear buttons. Any camera operator who knows like the basics of cameras will be able to throw a lens on this and get it working quickly. The BGH1, not only does it not have a touchscreen interface, it also doesn't have any white balance or ISO buttons. It just has a bunch of custom function buttons, which is okay. Like I understand the versatility of these buttons, but if you're trying to speed up a workflow and work with people who don't know these cameras super well, it is so much better to just have dedicated white balance and ISO buttons. I feel like those are things that people would want either way. So like, is it that important to have it on the top versus the front versus the bottom? Like just put it somewhere and call it WB and then you still, there's still gonna be like five function buttons on this thing. I, I really didn't think that, that was necessary. Ultimately, the unintuitiveness of this camera makes it so that we have to work for the camera rather than the camera's working for us. And unfortunately, that didn't really work. Reason number four, no autofocus. Now this one is a little bit more basic, but the need for autofocus has become more important to us in recent years. While we did start out doing 90% multi-camera concert capture where you have camera operators that are doing focus pulling live, we now do a lot more corporate work behind the scenes, throw cameras on a gimbal, and having that autofocus feature means that we can be more competitive with our pricing. Throw a very capable autofocus camera on a gimbal and have it be a one-man show. The lack of autofocus and the fact that this doesn't have an integrated screen does make it a little bit more difficult to just throw it on a gimbal and do that style of work. Reason number five, the micro four third sensor. Now, I understand that I'm sort of contradicting myself because at the beginning of this video, I spoke about the benefits of micro four thirds, but that's just because most people don't even see any of the benefits. There are obviously benefits to an APS-C style sensor or a full frame style sensor. And with the growth of my business, I've also felt the need to grow the sensor size in order to tackle a wider array of projects. We did circumvent this problem by buying two 0.64X Metabone speed boosters, which allowed us to use full frame Canon EF lenses on these cameras. These speed boosters allowed us to get a little bit more light as well as a larger depth of field. But ultimately that statement, the needing to buy something in order to solve a problem with this camera is the reason why we're getting rid of it. And so number six, let's talk about it. I don't think that this camera is worth the price. Now I know that's a huge statement because this is 
literally the most affordable cinema camera on Netflix's list of approved cameras. So how can it not be worth the price if it's the cheapest? So in order to get this camera to work for our needs, again, this whole video is about our needs. So the camera is worth $2,000. We invested in a Metabone 0.64X speed booster worth $650 US, a Ninja 5, worth $500 and a Blackmagic HDMI to SDI 6G converter worth $150. That totals at 3,300 US in order to get this camera up to speed for our needs. All of that for a camera that is still impractical to use, right? Because we did improve the sensor, we did have add the screen, but it still doesn't have autofocus. It still requires this whole HDMI to SDI conversion. It still doesn't have touch screen. So let's compare this BGH1 to two other cameras that I've been looking at in order to replace this. Let's start with a larger camera, broadcast oriented camera, the Blackmagic Broadcast G2. The BGH1 goes for 3,300. The Blackmagic Broadcast G2 goes for 4,195, I believe. With the Blackmagic, you're getting a 6K, Super 35 sensor, a 12G SDI out, touch screen, internal Blackmagic RAW recording, internal ND filters, and dedicated buttons on the side of the camera for shutter speed, ISO gain, blah, 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 all of that good broadcast stuff. The difference between those two cameras is $895. If you consider that the Blackmagic Broadcast G2 comes with a license of DaVinci Resolve Studio, which is valued at roughly $295 US, it sort of starts to become a no-brainer. Or another example in a sort of different line of work, the Sony FX30. The Sony FX30 comes with a screen, does have a touch screen, has great autofocus, and is an APS-C type sensor, which is a little bit larger than this, not quite full frame, but the price is, let me check, the price for the Sony FX30 is 1,800. So you're getting a lot of what this camera lacks for $1,500 less. Yes, it doesn't have the SDI out, but we still needed to circumvent that with an HDMI to SDI converter. So that's not really like a benefit of this camera. And this does have a dedicated time code in, which is fantastic, but you can buy an adapter for the Sony FX3 and Sony FX30. It's a bit consumery. I think the adapter is like a micro USB on the other end, which is not a super secure connection, but you can do time code. There are so many fantastic cameras that have been released since the BGH1 came out that I'm sorry to say it really is not holding up in 2022 going into 2023. If you've made it this far into the video, please consider subscribing and drop me a comment. Are you, do you already own a BGH1? Are you looking to invest in it? Why is it that you're watching this video? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. And if you're interested in these sort of videos where I dive deeper into the workflow, not necessarily the image quality of cameras, please consider subscribing. That's, that's sort of my thing. All right, I'm gonna go sell this camera now. See you guys.